Thank you all for joining us. For those of you who are new, I am Matthew Silverman, the director of the Haberman Institute for Jewish Studies. It is my pleasure to welcome all of you to our lecture with Joseph Weisberg, who will be discussing the experiences of Jews navigating their place on the white side of the color line in a society built on slavery in antebellum Charleston. Over the past few years, we have held several lectures on Jewish communities in the South, and questions about Jews and slavery were one of our prominent inquiries. Most of the conversations were very broad in nature. Today, we have the opportunity to take a closer look at a specific community living in Charleston. If you're interested in learning more on Southern Jewish culture, most of our prior lectures are on, on the recording page of our website. There you can watch such lectures as The Jews of Virginia, A Texan Perspective on Southern Jewish History, Southern Jews and Black Civil Rights, and The Jewish Experience in the American Civil War. All of these lectures are free of charge to watch, and we hope to keep all of our lectures and recordings free for all learners. As such, donations to support our mission of accessibility are greatly appreciated. Check out our website for details. Thank you to Bobby and Mike Goldman for sponsoring this lecture. Thank you also to Andrew R. Ammerman for sponsoring our spring 2024 lecture series. He dedicates this semester's learning in loving memory of Josephine and H. Max Ammerman, Stephen C. Ammerman, and Avi West. As usual, ask questions using the Q&A button on your Zoom screen. Please be as concise as possible and use complete sentences. Questions will be discussed at the end of the lecture, but feel free to write them in any time during the presentation. And I now welcome Rachel Eiches, a member of the Haberman Institute Board, who will introduce our speaker. Welcome friends near and far to tonight's program, From Generation to Generation, How Jewishness Influenced Slavery in Antebellum Charleston. I am Rachel Bertha Eiches, a member of the Board of Directors of Haberman Institute for, Stu for Jewish Studies, and I'm honored to introduce this talk with Joseph Weisberg. I'd like to extend a special welcome to all who are new to the Haberman Institute. Our mission is to provide high quality, in-depth encounters with Jewish thought, history, and culture. We invite you to learn more about Haberman Institute programs and classes by visiting our website, HabermanInstitute.org. Our next lecture is coming on April 10th as we welcome music historian Saul Lilienstein back to the Haberman Institute community to speak on Richard Wagner's operas and the Jews. We hope you'll join us. We also encourage you to check out our newest course, Revisiting Early Zionist Thinkers, a four-week exploration on Tuesday mornings that begins at the end of this month. Again, you can learn more about what's coming up at HabermanInstitute.org. And now on to this evening. My family has been traced back to an ancestor who arrived in a Virginia harbor in 1619. My father's enslaved grandmother, Rebecca, was 13 years old when the Emancipation Proclamation in 1863 made her a free woman able to eventually become a midwife in her community. I'm very eager to hear from tonight's speaker, Joseph Weisberg, a PhD student at Brandeis University. He studies American Jewish history and is particularly interested in Jews' relationship to slavery. His dissertation will investigate the ways that Jews' ethnic or religious identities may have influenced their interactions with slavery in North America. More broadly, his research interests include the history of slavery, Southern Jewish history, and African-American Jewish relations. Joseph also values making his scholarship accessible to the community and the general public. He's active as a public scholar. He's appeared in the documentary film, co-authored a project on the history of a local public library, and is currently an associate research fellow with the Harvard Slavery Remembrance Project. Thank you, Joseph, for sharing your insight with us this evening. The Zoom box is yours. Thank you, Rachel, for that nice introduction. 
Um, and thank you everyone for coming to hear me speak today when the Haberman Institute told me how um, popular this event was. I was uh, surprised and hope that I can um, live up to the billing here. Um, I do want to apologize before I get going. You might be able to see that I'm on like the back end of a cold. So if I sound um, ill as I'm speaking here, um, I am. But hopefully we can uh, we, we can push through and being on Zoom um, helps us in that way. I also want to say um, the piece. So I want to give a little piece of background on the piece that I'm sharing today, which is excerpted and adapted from an article length project that I'm working on. Um, the, length, the provisional title of that piece is a member of the tribe, Dr. Jacob de la Mata, his estate and a slave supporting Jewish kinship network in antebellum Charleston. Um, eventually, I do hope to publish that as an article, so it's not my dissertation project, but it is a project that I've um, been engaged with now for a little bit. And then finally, before I um, continue, I do want to just say ahead of time, because of how this research worked, looking at kinship networks within a community, there's a lot of names in what I'm going to say. I've tried to flag the names that are important and come up with different ways for you to kind of see the names and, and figure out what is what, what are the important names to track. But if I do lose you, that's 100% okay. I just ask that you stick with me, right? Stick with me. I will try to come at the end and, and give wrap up summaries where you can kind of get the main point of what I'm saying. So please don't get lost in the sea of names, just stick with me. And with that, I would um, like to start in earnest. And I'd like to start my time with you guys today, as I often start my discussions with students. I'm gonna show you a short document, and then I'm gonna ask you a question about it. The document, which you can see on your screen. Yes, Matt, can you give me a thumbs up? You can see it on your screen, yeah. Um, the document, which you can see on your screen, reads as follows. Know all men by these presents that I, Samuel Minx of Charleston, in the provision of Carolina, for and in consideration of the sum of 50 pounds sterling by Simon Valentine, merchant, to me well and truly contented and paid, have by these presents do grant, bargain, sell, assign and set over unto the said Simon Valentine, one Negro man by name Dick, to have and enjoy the said Negro to the said Simon Valentine, his heirs and assignees forever. And I, the said Samuel Minx, will, uh, will warrant and forever defend the said Negro to the said Samuel Valentine against all manner of persons whatsoever. Witness my hand this um, 7 and 20th day of October, Anno Domini 1696, signed Samuel Minx. And so my question for you is relatively straightforward. Um, what do you think this document is and why? I'll give you kind of a minute or two to write down your thoughts. And then if you're so inclined um, to share them in a poll that should populate. Great. Um, so many of you said, and you're right, that this document is a bill of sale or a receipt for the exchange of an enslaved man named Dick. Some highlighted the legal qualities of the document, like where Minx um, guarantees that he'll defend Valentine's property rights against challenges. All of these interpretations are correct, and we'll come back to the importance of legal documents for protecting people's interest in the institution of slavery. So now, however, I'd like to lay out another interpretation of this 17th century document. According to one historian, and I'm quoting here, the first Jews known by name appear together in the same record when, Samuel, when Simon Valentine sold a slave to Samuel Minx. Put differently, the sale of Dink marks one potential starting point for intracommunal Jewish history of South Carolina. Dick and his two Jewish enslavers will not be reoccurring uh, characters in the story that follows, but they're going to stick with us here for like another 30 seconds. But I like to begin with this example because it sheds light not just on what we know about the past, but also how we know it. And I like this particular example because it undercuts the idea that Jewish and African-American history are mutually exclusive. 
Here we have one of the earliest pieces of evidence of the Jewish presence in Charleston that also attests to the commodification of a black man named Dick. We only learn about these Jewish pioneers because one of them sought to sell another human, Dick, to his co-religionists. Now you may have, you might be forgiven for having missed this fact. Southern Jewish historians have provided little reason to consider the sale of Dick as much more than a footnote in a broader conversation about acculturation. They've consistently rejected the idea that Jewishness or Judaism influenced how Southern Jews approached the institution of slavery. However, recent arguments from the economic turn in American Jewish history sit uneasily with the insistence that being Jewish did not affect how Jews interacted with slavery. These scholars broadly cite ethnic and kinship ties as one factor that advantageously positioned Jews within the 19th century economy. Ethnic and kinship ties, they tell us, built trust that provided Jews access to credit that was essential for economic success. So while it's possible that slavery constituted a distinct space within the economy where Jewish connections may, may, uh, meant little, the case of Dr. Jacob de la Mata and his estate does not support such a conclusion. De la Mata's case, which will be the center of our conversation today, suggests that the Jewish community of Charleston may have supported each other's participation with and interest in the institution of slavery. My lecture today focuses on Jacob de la Mata and eventually his estate after he moved to Charleston in 1823. By then, he was accomplished in his profession, in Jewish life, communal affairs, and masonry. Although his most prolific biographer has described the city that greeted him as, quote, the metropolis of a thriving plantation economy, Charleston had already begun to decline by the time Delamata arrived. The city's economy suffered in the wake of the Panic of 1819. Emigration increased, immigration decreased, and economic growth stalled as Charleston lost its preeminence as a jewel of the South. In 1822, the discovery of a slave conspiracy led by Dunbar Fessy sent shockwaves through a city that was already on edge. Historian Deborah Dash Moore has connected the sense of crisis generated by the Fessy conspiracy to the earliest attempts at Jewish religious reform in Charleston. Now, in particular, I'd like to argue that Dilamata served as a node that connected different corners of his extended family via the institution of slavery, relying upon bonds that were strong enough to withstand the religious tensions of the period. I focus on two arenas that we might consider Jewish, kinship and social contact within Jewish institutions that influenced how Dilamata and his family interacted with slavery in antebellum Charleston. So in short, my lecture will sketch one case in which Jewishness served as a form of social capital within antebellum slave systems. I will sketch these claims by focusing on an enslaved carpenter named Elijah, who De La Mata first purchased for his son. Elijah passed into the hands of Benjamin Lazarus when Jacob De La Mata died before his son reached the age of majority. So Lazarus is the executor of the estate. In 1850, Elijah was hired out by Benjamin Lazarus to his brother, Joshua. When Elijah unsuccessfully tried to emancipate himself the following year, Benjamin Lazarus responded by selling Elijah within eight days of paying the bill for his capture. Among the witnesses to his sale was Lazarus's relative, Thomas Whitlock Mordecai, whose relationship with other members of the De La Mata family network can be traced years earlier in the Jewish institutions of Charleston. We will then turn to the sale of an enslaved woman named Rena um, to see how Benjamin Lazarus leveraged relationships that reflected years of mutual contact within Charleston's Jewish institutions in order to navigate economic life in a slave society. So I will conclude my talk then by briefly reflecting upon the reality that the Jewishness of enslavers was far from the only identity that informed their participation in the slave economy. Now, to be clear, I will not be arguing that Jews played an outsized role in the slave trade, nor do I suggest that a majority of Dilamata's business in enslaved people occurred within a Jewish milieu. Rather, I want to suggest that an extended family network constituted one pool of resources that Dilamata and Lazarus used in order to protect their interest in the institution of slavery. Indeed, 
In some sense, members of the Dilamata Lazarus Extended Family Network were practicing business as usual. It is the somewhat unremarkable nature of their mutual support that makes it noteworthy. American Jewish historians have recognized the role of ethnicity and kinship in forging commercial ties, but they've been reluctant to acknowledge that these ties influence business and human property, as well as more commonplace items like dry goods. Jacob de la Mata, Benjamin Lazarus, and the other members of their extended kinship network did not operate as a clandestine cabal working undercover to enslave and oppress African Americans. Rather, they worked together in the open as members of a society where slavery was ubiquitous, accepted, and legally sanctioned. Their collaboration was in many ways a response to their situation and circumstances. So now, before I continue into the details of my argument, I would like to linger over this contention just for one moment longer. As a historian, I am broadly interested in reassessing American Jews' relationship to slavery, which almost inevitably leads back to the work of Bertram Korn and his conclusion that being Jewish did not play any discernible role in the determination of the relationship of Jews to slavery. The research that I'm sharing with you today is one fragment of my, and indeed um, some of my colleagues working at other institutions, collective efforts to probe the contours of this claim. While it might be uncomfortable for us to talk about enslaving networks, I hope my research um, can shed light on the ways that Jewishness itself could serve as a form of social capital within antebellum slave systems. Though I will be talking about um, antebellum Charleston, I do imagine that my talk will resonate with some of you who have been engaged in difficult conversations about Jews and race in the United States. The case of Jacob de la Mata and the slave supporting network that we'll explore provides an example of one way that Jews benefited from white supremacy in America, even as they sometimes stood apart from the Protestant mainstream. And so with that, let's get into um, kind of part one of two parts. Um, so this first part will look at um, the near and distant kin working within this um, slave supporting network. So I first came up with the title of my talk when I was working in the most intimate part of Dilamada's family network, analyzing what Dilamada left for his son, Jacob Emanuel. As a father, he ensured that his oldest son inherited two cultural legacies. First, a state records make clear that Jacob Emanuel received a Jewish education, as you can see on the slide. Second, while he was still living, Dilamata facilitated his son's entrance into the white enslaving class before Jacob Emanuel had celebrated his seventh birthday. In 1843, Dilamata purchased an enslaved boy named Elijah in trust for Jacob Emanuel. Elijah was about 14 years old when he was purchased as property for his not yet seven-year-old master master. By that age, Elijah undoubtedly understood the difference between himself and his enslaver. He had already confronted the realities of his status as chattel when he was forced to work for the benefit of someone other than himself, and again when he was uprooted and sold. In contrast, Elijah's new master had not yet reached his seventh birthday and was likely still learning the differences between the enslaved and enslavers. For young white children, enslaving was a learned activity that took place as they matured. Adults often taught their children about slavery through books and stories, as well as indirect means like the visual cues that permeate a slave society. In purchasing Elijah, Jacob de la Mata ensured that his son would not miss this lesson. For de la Mata, the decision to purchase an adolescent male like Elijah also promised to provide his son with a solid financial foundation. Enslaved people tended to appreciate in monetary value throughout their teenage years and into the early 20s, with men tending to reach higher peak values than their female counterparts. Now, of course, the monetary value of enslaved people spoke little about what historian Dana Rainey Berry refers to as their soul value. Still, an enslaver like the Lomada, who was more interested in the external valuation of enslaved people than their self realized internal valuations could presumably assume, could, they could reasonably assume that Elijah's um, value would increase close to $1,000 by 
by the time his son came of age. In other words, De La Mata could hope that investment in slavery would generate intergenerational wealth for his family. Still, and stick with me here, the decision to invest in slavery was just that, a consciously made decision. As American Jewish historians have noted, Jews adopted slavery as an axiomatic aspect of antebellum Southern life. Nonetheless, the case of Jacob de la Mata reminds us that they did not become slave owners by osmosis. An inventory of de la Mata's estate, which was produced less than two full years after he purchased Elijah for Jacob Emanuel, shows that the doctor was aware of and invested in other sources of wealth. Enslaved people um, accounted for just under half of de la Mata's total estate. The remainder mostly consisted of cash, specie, stocks, unpaid rents, and promissory notes. Although these investments likely derived value from the slave economy, they represented an alternative to direct investment in slavery. In fact, the existence of archival evidence that attests to Dilamata's enslaving captures the voluntary aspect of these transactions. Voluntary, of course, here means only from the point of view of enslavers. Bills of sale often contain the signature of the seller and language that confirmed their consent to the agreement. In the case of Elijah, the bill of sale contains a handwritten appendix that reads, and you can read with me here, personally appeared before Thomas W. Mordecai and made oath that he saw John W. Forward sign and seal the within bill of sale and that this deponent signed as witness to the execution thereof. Other bills of sale confirmed Delamata's active consent to sell enslaved people named William and Rose. In this context, Delamata's decision to purchase Elijah represented more than an attempt to create a financial nest egg for his son. By purchasing Elijah, Delamata created intergenerational interest in the institution of slavery. By 1843, Jacob Delamata had already demonstrated his willingness to actively participate in the slave economy and support the institution of slavery. He made sure to initiate his son into that system, setting up Jacob Emanuel with a financial head start that would also attach him to the system of white supremacy that defined the antebellum South. Put differently, for Jacob de la Mata, Judaism was not the only tradition that should be passed down from generation to generation. Slave owning also passed from father to son. So let's get into, um, let's, let's keep going here. If Dilamada's gift of Elijah to his son demonstrates the innermost contours of the Dilamada Lazarus family network, then we can now expand our vision to explore how non consanguinean kinship ties that is, connections not dependent on blood, allowed De La Mata, his estate, and their families to support and benefit from slavery. In particular, De La Mata and his estate often rely on the connections created between brothers-in-law when they needed to safeguard their interest in the institution of slavery. And his brothers-in-law, on the flip side, relied on his estate when they needed temporary slave labor. De La Mata seems to have understood the importance of his network when he chose two extended relations to carry out his final testament. In particular, De La Mata's brother-in-law, Benjamin D. Lazarus, would not have been an obvious choice to serve as the executor of the doctor's estate. At the time De La Mata formalized his will in 1842, he and Lazarus found themselves on opposite sides of a heated religious dispute in Charleston. The controversy arose when members of Kahal Kadosh Beth Elohim, which until then had been the only synagogue in Charleston, the only congregation, um, voted to include an organ in their new building. A noticeable minority of the members opposed this modification as a violation of Minhag Sephardim and the subsequent reforms that the organ seemed to announce. In response, they permanently shattered the unity of the Charleston Jewish community and formed a breakaway congregation that they sharply named Sherith Israel, or Remnant of Israel. Although he had earlier praised the use of an organ in Savannah, 
um, De La Mata quickly became a leader of the traditionalist faction, while his brother-in-law supported the reforms at Beth Elohim. We don't need to imagine what Jacob de la Mata thought about the reforms at Beth Elohim. Uh, luckily for us, he addressed the topic in a eulogy for fellow traditionalist Nathan Hart. He said, and I'm quoting here, it was determined, let us say, by adverse policy, then in room, an insurmountable breach should be made into former customs under the specious show and termed by some improvement. He continued to describe the, quote, mutations, the misconceived opinions that all too often regulate the conduct or that exercise influence over the actions of those who advocate improvements on erroneous constructive principles, end quote, as incompatible with the point of view of a traditional, of a steady religionist like Hart. So by extension, De La Mata applied this standard of steady religionist to himself and his fellow congregants in Sheriff Israel, who could not accept the trend towards reform within Beth Elohim. Nor were these empty words. Bill Amada subsequently served as the president of Sheriff Israel and affixed his name atop the list of petitioners who requested formal recognition from the state legislature in 1840. He likely still served in that capacity in 1842 when he finalized his will. In contrast, Benjamin D. Lazarus was an ordinary but active supporter of reform at Beth Elohim. Lazarus signed the petition that eventually incensed the traditional faction enough to form their own congregation and remain committed to the cause three years later. At that point, the two sides went to court over who controlled the newly constructed Beth Elohim synagogue. Lazarus signed on to the case with the reform faction, which eventually won the dispute. In other words, Lazarus advocated for the very reforms that De La Mata described as an insurmountable breach in Jewish tradition. Nonetheless, De La Mata still trusted Lazarus with the weighty task of carrying out his final wishes. We cannot know the exact judgments that ran through De La Mata's mind as he made this decision to have his brother-in-law oversee his estate. Subsequent events do suggest that De La Mata moderated his stance towards reform in the waning years of his life. The Occident reported that De La Mata took a stance of non-interference towards reform in the period preceding his death in 1845, apparently because, and I'm quoting here, his female relatives were attached to the new order of things. However, he only seems to have done so after he appointed Lazarus executor of his estate and after the acrimonious dispute between traditionalists and reformers had already torn the Jewish community asunder. Extant archival evidence does not allow us to peer into the De La Mata Lazarus family dynamic. However, given the circumstances, his choice of executor seems anything but perfunctory. Nor can we overlook the close relationship between slavery and serving as the executor of an estate in antebellum Charleston, so this is a more uh, a broader point here, slavery constituted a prominent, though by no means exclusive, portion of the executor's work. Historians who have noted De La Mata's slave owning have frequently uh, referred to provisions he made in his will regarding an enslaved woman named Anne Maria and her son Augustus. Yet, Despite the captivating nature of this case, the historiographical focus on Anne Maria and Augustus has obscured the fact that Dilamata's will does not mention the majority of the people he enslaved. However, the will bequeathed the remainder of Dilamata's property to his executors in trust for his wife and children. Um, and when it did this, it gave Lazarus control of an enslaved workforce of 14 people. Lazarus apparently understood this task and quickly went about organizing the workforce after De La Mata died in February. By the end of March, Lazarus had acquired badges for two enslaved women named Martha and Venus, which you can see on the slide on the top side there, recorded the inventory of an estate that included counting for its enslaved property and created a bill of sale for the purchase of Elijah that De La Mata had never actually formally recorded when he was alive. In case Lazarus's actions did not um, clearly enough signify his new role as enslaver, 
Lazarus was later, and this is in this hard to read handwriting here at the bottom, he was later granted permission for the sale of the Negroes recorded in the inventory, not specifically bequeathed. Lazarus made use of this power at least seven times between the time he received it in 1847 and his final sale in 1863. In the process, he inevitably altered the lives of Martha, Rena, Charity, Sylvia, Dawn, Sam, and Elijah. In addition to the provisions he made in his will, Bill Amata continued to influence his family's involvement with slavery after he died. With Benjamin Doors Lazarus as his executor, Bill Amata's estate became an access point that allowed his extended family to support the institution of slavery, either by directly participating in the slave economy or by assuming ancillary roles that upheld Lazarus's role as enslaver. In this way, Dilamata became a node that connected a network of Lazaruses and their spouses. Although not every member of the Lazarus family, and you can see how many of, there are, of them there are up there, so although not every member of this family wove themselves into this network, some of Dilamata's other brothers-in-law, and even one of their brothers-in-law without a direct connection to Dilamata, worked their way into the archival record by sanctioning and sometimes conducting business that involved people enslaved by his estate. So it's here where we can once again find Elijah. In 1850, Benjamin Lazarus's brother Joshua paid the estate almost $100 to hire Elijah. Although Joshua Lazarus already enslaved 10 people, he may have hired Elijah for the enslaved man's expertise as a carpenter. It was not uncommon to hire enslaved people for jobs that required skilled labor. For example, Joshua Lazarus was vice president of the board of trustees of Beth Elohim when the congregation hired an enslaved jeweler to repair its Torah finials, Rimonim in Hebrew, and later employed another enslaved person to paint the Ten Commandments and 13 Articles of Faith on the east wall of the synagogue. In fact, the congregation notes builder enslaved two carpenters, Kit and George, who likely helped erect the building. Joshua Lazarus drew on these familiar practices when he hired Elijah from his brother-in-law's estate. In 1851, so this is the following year, the estate advertised Elijah for sale as a good carpenter, having been employed as such for years. However, the advertisement dissembled. Its mundanity provided a misleading sense of consent to this employment. In reality, Elijah resisted his status as a slave and took steps to reclaim his body from his enslavers. He attempted to emancipate himself some point sometime between when he was hired by Joshua Lazarus in May of 1850 and apprehended as a runaway on February 11th, 1851. Elijah's enslaver was evidently not sympathetic to his attempts to ameliorate his condition and took little time to decide what to do about Elijah's thwarted escape. He purchased an advertisement to sell Elijah within four days of paying a bill for, quote, apprehending Eli runaway. Elijah's skill as a carpenter, which explains why somebody like Joshua Lazarus, who already enslaved 10 people, would need to reach into his family network for additional enslaved labor. So his skill as a carpenter, it only reaches us under these trying circumstances. Jacob de la Mata, his son, Benjamin Lazarus, Joshua Lazarus, um, were not the only members of the extended family that contributed to Elijah's enslavement. Six years earlier, the estate had formally recorded the bill of sale for the purchase of Elijah. The document contains the signatures of Thomas W. Mordecai, who served as a witness to the transaction. Mordecai, who was a Jewish broker and, auction and auctioneer in Charleston, appears elsewhere in the records of the estate showing that these family connections were not exclusively limited to the realm of slavery. 
1840, he gained a new brother-in-law when Benjamin Lazarus married Mordecai's sister-in-law, Cornelia Cohen. You can see on this family tree. As a result, Mordecai was also a distant relative of Jacob de la Mata. Although the act of witnessing a bill of sale, it seems rather ordinary, it provided a central support to the institution of slavery. Witnesses certified the train of transmission of an enslaved person as property, protecting the new enslaver from legal challenges. Some disputes over the title to an enslaved person hinged upon the presence of a witness. So, for example, in 1831, the Supreme Court of North Carolina upheld the decision of a lower court to void a title to an enslaved person because it was not attested by a witness. Two years later, a Tennessee court disqualified a deed as evidence because it had only been proved by one witness rather than the two required by law. So by serving as a witness, Mordecai helped create the documentary record that buttressed the estate's claim to enslave Elijah. And so with that, we aren't going to leave um, my friend here. Thomas Mordecai, but we are going to move into part two, kinship, social contact, and Charleston's Jewish institutions. So while it might really seem tempting to dismiss Thomas Mordecai's involvement with the estate as a one-off business arrangement, doing so would ignore the broader context of Charleston's Jewish institutions. Many of the business transactions associated with Delamada and his estate built on relationships that had been forged within Jewish institutions like the Hebrew Orphan Society, the Reform Society of Israelites, and even Isaac Harvey's Secular Academy that attracted many Jewish families. Mordecai was just one person involved in this broader web. The role of Jewish institutions in the slave-supporting network of Jacob Delamada, Benjamin Lazarus, and their extended kin comes into clearer focus if we trace the sale of an enslaved woman named Rena in 1852. Sorry about that. Her sale helps illuminate a layer of the Jewish slave supporting network composed of Jews within dis with distant family ties to Delamata and Lazarus, but who nonetheless help support their activities as enslavers. Like the more tightly knit corners of the family network, these people participated in a wide range of activities besides buying and selling enslaved people. In fact, there is currently no evidence that Dilamata or his executor ever exchanged an enslaved person with another Jew. Nonetheless, the people who formed this network performed a variety of acts that supported the enslaver's interest in the institution of slavery. In this case, the broker and auctioneer Isaac Moiza served as a broker for a transaction with another enslaver. On February 3rd, 1852, Moiza advertised an auction for a very valuable servant woman named Rena, about 22 years of age. Rena, we learned from the advertisement, was a domestic worker whose skills included sewing, serving as a lady's maid, and performing other duties expected of a quote-unquote house servant. We also learned from the advertisement that Rena was sent to auction as part of an estate. Other sources revealed that she had been enslaved by Jacob de la Mata until Benjamin D. Lazarus assumed the mantle of executor turned enslaver upon de la Mata's death in 1845. As property of Lazarus, Rena encountered a range of experiences associated with slavery, including its most devastating. She was hired out at least twice and buried an infant in April of 1851. Now, less than a year later, she was headed to the auction block, but may have been able to thwart a sale. Moiza later advertised an anonymous seamstress and ladies maid whose description matched um, Rena's at private sale. Ultimately, however, whatever resistance Rena mounted was short-lived and could not overcome the sheer force of the slave regime. She was sold on February 19th. 
As a broker, Moiza was the closest a Jew came to purchasing or selling enslaved, an enslaved person from Delamana or his estate. Though he did not assume the mantle of enslaver, Moiza was directly involved in the sale. He collected a $15 commission for arranging the sale, which is about 500, a little more than $550 um, in 2023. However, it's probably more accurate to describe Moiza as a broker whose business included enslaved people than as a slave trader whose primary concern was trafficking enslaved people. Most of his business involved financial assets and real estate, and he's actually listed as a stockbroker in the 1852 city directory. Moiza advertised about 14 different enslaved people in the Charleston Daily Courier between 1851 and 1853. In comparison, another agent who brokered two transactions for the estate advertised almost that many people for sale in one day in 1850. So we are then stuck with this question of why Lazarus passed Isaac Moiza with the sale of Rena. And to be clear, no record exists that can irrefutably answer that question. But the historical record offers two reasons why Lazarus may have chosen to do business with Moiza and conversely why Moiza would accept it. Physical proximity may have played a role in the decision. Moiza listed two addresses in the 1852 city directory. One of those addresses was only a few blocks from Benjamin Lazarus. However, physical proximity in a dense urban environment like Charleston cannot entirely explain why Lazarus decided to sell Rena through Moiza. Their relationship comes into clearer focus when we analyze the complex connections that tied families together within Charleston's Jewish community. Lazarus and Moiza's brief business collaboration was just one episode in a relationship that formed within Charleston's Jewish institutions and brought their families together in marriage. Moiza's relationship with members of the Delamata Lazarus family, as well as others who later joined it through marriage, dates to more than three decades before the sale of Reno. When the local journalist and teacher Isaac Harvey became the vice president of the Hebrew Orphan Society, so this is the first of three institutions I'll talk about, in 1850, he joined a multi-generational assortment of Jewish men that included members of the Moiza and Lazarus families. Harvey's biographer marks his involvement as a major turning point in the society as a group that he calls Harvey's own friends, a group of younger men that counted Isaac Moiza, his brothers, Abraham and Jacob, as well as Michael Lazarus among its members. So this group of Isaac Harvey's friends began to fulfill a more prominent role in the society. Some of the men likely already knew each other from Beth Elohim. More important, the characterization of them as friends underscores the point that their relationship seems to have been one of more than just mutual association. And indeed, as these men became involved with the society, with the Hebrew Orphan Society, they continued a larger multi-generational legacy. The Hebrew Orphan Society counted the Lazarus's patriarch Marx, his oldest son Aaron, and Jacob de Lamada's father among its inaugural members in 1801. Pardon me. Isaac Moiza's two oldest brothers and Jacob de Lamada's uncle joined only a few months later. So by the time Isaac Moiza became a member in 1821, the society featured four Lazarus men, all of Isaac Moiza's brothers except for Abraham and Jacob de Lamada himself. Almost all of these men, and now it's worth uh, highlighting here that the organization's earliest extant constitution makes clear that any person having attained his 18th year could apply for membership, and it had never had a female member when its history was chronicled in 1957. So almost all of the men who constituted um, the extended Dilamata Lazarus family network eventually joined the ranks of the Hebrew Orphan Society. Benjamin Lazarus, 
uh, joined the society about six months after Isaac Moiza. Thomas Whitlock Mordecai joined almost a decade later. But he was still a member of the society for two decades before he witnessed the bill of sale for Elijah in 1845. Now, although membership in the Hebrew Orphan Society became honorific in the 20th century, so if any of you are in Charleston now, um, you might know that it became honorific, um, this was not the case in the 19th century. The organization's his, um, historian commented that an amendment to its constitution in 1944, so about you know 100 years after what we're talking about, recognized the change in the society from an organization directly engaged in administering charity through a trusteeship of capital funds, the income of which went largely to professional social service agencies. But in the antebellum period, this change was far from afoot. The society administered charity directly to its constituents and developed an organizational structure to support its mission. The precise details of the society's earliest extant operations are difficult to discern, but it likely meant monthly to carry out its mission. If its earliest extant constitution is any indication, involvement was highly encouraged. The post-bellum document allowed the society to find members and officers for missing the organization's annual anniversary dinner, not voting on a matter before the organization, or resigning from a leadership position. So in short, and if I've lost you in this Hebrew Orphan Society talk, come with me here. The Hebrew Orphan Society required more than simply writing a check. It asked members to invest time in the organization's mission. In the process, it fostered contact between Jewish men in Charleston. There we go. Oh, there we go. Many of these same men who I've just been talking about strengthened their social ties within the Reform Society of Israelites. So this is the second of three organizations. The Reform Society was founded in 1825 after leaders at Beth Elohim rejected a petition that advocated for changes in its manner of worship. The petition carried the signatures of 47 Jewish men, but it was likely written by Abraham Moiza. His brother Isaac, the broker, was a member and would have witnessed firsthand the close social ties his family enjoyed with the Lazaruses. Abraham Moiza fulfilled a prominent role throughout the organization's history while Michael Lazarus served as a vice president in 1825 and president the following year. In the society's waning years, Abraham Moiza served as president with Benjamin Lazarus's future brother-in-law, Thomas W. Mordecai, filling the roles of treasurer and secretary. Lazarus's then current brother-in-law, Meyer Jacobs, who we haven't spoken about, also belonged to the society as a rank and file member. All three of these men, Michael Lazarus, Meyer Jacobs, and Thomas Whitlock Mordecai, would later support De La Mata and his estate's participation in the slave economy. In fact, the society's eventual disintegration brought Abraham into direct contact with Jacob De La Mata himself. The two men served together on a committee that rewrote Beth Elohim's constitution in 1836. Close social contact may have developed into a familial tie within the Reformed society. The, um, unfortunately, the patriarchal nature of the society, and once again here, we're really limited by the organization's constitution, conceals the role of two women who are central to this story. Hannah Moses, whose uh, maiden name was Lazarus, and her daughter, Caroline Agnes. Anna was yet another one of the 17 Lazarus siblings. She became a common ancestor of the Moiza and Lazarus families when her daughter married Abraham Moiza in 1827. Naturally, we have questions about the precise nature of their involvement that I haven't yet been able to answer. Did these women attend the meetings and services of the Reformed Society? We know, um, yeah. Did we, uh, ignore me, right? Did they attend these meetings? Did Caroline and Abraham develop their courtship through the Reformed Society? 
While the answers to these questions can be tantalizing, Abraham Moise's future brother-in-law, Isaac Clifton Moses, certainly belonged to the or, um, society. There, Moses undoubtedly developed a rapport or a relationship with Moisa, who was its vice president the year of the marriage. Of course, a common association within the Reformed society does not necessarily mean that their relationship formed under its auspices, but it does point to a social connection that may have been strong enough to forge a kinship bond. Fortunately, other records do allow us to locate women who later formed part of the extended Dilamana Lazarus family network. They don't say much, unfortunately, about the interactions themselves, but they allow us to find them, right? Caroline Agnes Moses was likely familiar with Hetty Lopez, and here there's a lot of names. Lopez later became um, Caroline Agnes Moses's sister-in-law through marriage. They likely knew each other since their days at Isaac Harvey's Academy. The two were also schoolmates of another one of Caroline's future sisters-in-law, Angelina Lazarus, who was also the niece of Benjamin Lazarus, a lot going on there. Although the academy, it wasn't a sectarian institution, it served a mostly Jewish constituency. Jewish parents were likely attracted to Harvey's school because they would receive an education without the pressures of an evangelizing instructor. So as a result, about three quarters of Harvey's students were Jewish in 1819. Caroline Agnes Moses, Hetty Lopez, and Angelina Lazarus may have had some of their earliest interactions in this mostly Jewish milieu. So let's wrap up these, um, this conversation here uh, of the institutions. On balance then, the Dilamata, Lazarus, and Moisa families developed deep social ties across a wide range of Jewish institutions in the city. In addition to contact within Beth Elohim, they had been confers in the Hebrew Orphan Society for more than a generation, cemented some of those relationships in the Reformed Society of Israelites, and educated their children in the predominantly Jewish Harvey Academy. While these associations might seem serendipitous, they reflect a broader reality of 19th century American Jewish history. As Sherry Rabin reminds us, American Jews belonged and sort of belonged and didn't belong to a wide range of social groupings, of which congregations seem to have been one of the less popular options. Fraternal and social organizations offered alternative ways of affiliating with other Jews in antebellum Charleston. And in antebellum Charleston itself, there was no shortage of these alternative options. The Dilamata, Lazarus, and Moisa families belonged to these organizations for decades. They were deeply invested in the city's non-congregational Jewish institutions, created close enough relationships to produce kinship ties, and at times were actually bound together by marriage. So let's come back to here, to this question that we sent off, right? Why did Benjamin Lazarus choose to sell Rina through Isaac Moisa? Against this backdrop that I've just laid out, Benjamin Lazarus's decision to use Isaac Moisa as a broker for the sale of Rena hardly seems coincidental. A complex web of social and kinship ties knotted the two men together. Building on this deeply rooted relationship, Lazarus likely operated with confidence when he chose Isaac Moisa to help sell Rena. Moreover, auctioneers and brokers were somewhat ubiquitous in Antebellum Charleston. Given the competitive nature of the industry and their common background, their pairing does not seem accidental. Bringing the relationship between these two families into focus highlights how vast an extended kinship network could reach while still providing mutual support in the slave economy. Isaac Moisa and Benjamin Lazarus were not closely related. Isaac was the brother of Lazarus's nephew-in-law. So in other words, Isaac wasn't just a distant relative, but also a distant relative of a different generation on the family tree. Yet, both men were able to benefit from the proximity of their families in order to participate in the slave economy. In Moisa, 
Lazarus seems to have found somebody who he trusted to find a buyer for Rena. In Lazarus, Moisa found a client whose patronage generated revenue for his business, even if enslaved people were not quite his typical um, business. In this capacity, Dilamata continued to connect a far-flung extended kinship network even after he died. Though Benjamin Lazarus often relied on his kinship network to manage the estate, Dilamata provided the occasion and the resources for their collaboration. When we focus on the different people who came together to help Lazarus manage the estate after Dilamata's death, pardon me, we begin to see the extended kinship network that he relied on as an interconnected set of smaller associations. For instance, one of the three appraisers of the estate was D.C. Levy, which most likely reforms, uh, refers to the former Reform Society, David Cardozo Levy. Levy's wife was a member of the Moses clan, so he was a brother-in-law of Abraham Moisa and distantly related to the Lazaruses by marriage. However, his relationship with Delamada is one degree further removed and relies on the Lazaruses. Overall, then, we can discern a collection of micro networks within the extended network. So you can read with me here from kind of right to left across this um, graphic that I've created. Delamada and his immediate family, Delamada and extended members of the Lazarus family, the other side of the Lazarus family based on their connections with the Moseses, and then the Moses' own connections. Altogether, these micro networks provide a vast pool of resources that could be leveraged to help each other in a wide range of areas, including participation in the slave economy. And in a slave society, I should even say. So with that, let's start to wrap it up here. The last enslaved person known to have been sold by the estate of Jacob de la Mata was a woman named Charity. She was sold on April 3rd, 1863, about three months after President Lincoln issued the Emancipation Proclamation. De la Mata's survivors benefited from Charity's labor by hiring her out for almost two decades. Now, with the future of slavery hanging in the balance, Benjamin Lazarus performed what was likely his final act as executor turned enslaver for his deceased brother-in-law. Charity Sale does not seem to have relied on the Delamata Lazarus extended kinship network beyond Lazarus's role as her enslaver. In that sense, her sale represents another regular feature of Delamata and his estate. Most of their business in enslaved people occurred outside of a Jewish milieu and or relied on networks that were not Jewish in character. Remember here, Jews only constituted about 2% of the white population of Charleston in 1850. So this is not altogether surprising. For example, though I don't have time to lay this out, um, lay out the details this evening, Jacob de la Mata and his estate sometimes drew on professional connections with physicians when they needed to sell enslaved people um, from the, or when they needed to sell people enslaved by the Jewish doctor, I should say. This reality meant that some people who were enslaved by Jews could live within a world at the crossroads of Jewish and non Jewish networks. Yet, for others like charity, the ethno religious identity of their enslaver was less significant. I'll remind you at this point that we set out not to explore the question of whether or not Jews played an outsized role in the slave trade. They did not. Instead, we set out to evaluate the more complex question of how Jewishness may have influenced Jews' relationship to slavery in antebellum South Carolina. I hope that I've made clear that Dilamata and his estate relied on a network of near and distant kin in order to support and protect their interests in the institution of slavery. They drew on family connections to fulfill a number of rules that did not necessarily entail buying and selling enslaved people, but still supported the enslaver's position within the slave economy. 
Family members served De La Mata and his estate as executors, witnesses, brokers, purchasers of labor, and appraisers. In the process, De La Mata became a node that connected different corners of his extended family and offered them an opportunity to support the institution of slavery, to benefit from the institution of slavery as well. This network extended far beyond the nuclear family or even a tight group of in-laws and immediate cousins. It included distant relatives who were connected to the family through a series of marriages and forged intergenerational interest in the institution of slavery. Importantly, the relationships that held the more distant corners of this network together seem to have been rooted in Charleston's Jewish institution. At least in this case, Jewishness seems to have provided some common ground for the members of this network to support and benefit from chattel slavery. And with that, I want to thank you all for um, listening to me talk and um, look forward to having entering into some question and answer period. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Joseph, for uh, sharing all of your, your research in, in this wonderful presentation. We have a number of questions to jump into, and those of you who have questions, feel free to continue to send them in. Um, several people asked, and you, you, you answered it um, briefly, just, just sort of toward the end of your presentation, about how many Jews lived in Charleston. And um, additionally, um, if you know what percentage uh, owned slaves yeah, sure. Um, so the percentage question is something um, I, I I see numbers that really um, go like I I've seen numbers that are I, I would have to go back to the sources to try to figure out how exactly they correspond with each other. So I'm not going to give a number, not because I don't think they exist, but because I um I think we need to do a little bit more digging to figure out um, the exact percentages. But I can tell you that it's fairly typical um, for Jews in Charleston to own enslaved people. In the cities, um, Jews owned, in the cities, people, and including Jews, they tended to own slaves slightly more frequently than um, kind of in the hinterlands, but they tended to um, own fewer people. So um, a lot of the people in Charleston more generally um, have two or three enslaved people that belong to them. Um, on the second question of numbers, I wrote this down because I knew it would come up. Um, in Charleston in 1820, it has between like 600 and 700 Jewish families. Um, like anything, the number, j just quoting, right? And this goes back to my, my comment before about giving a percentage of the number of Jews who owned um, slaves. Just figuring out how many Jews are in a place, like even in the contemporary day, um, is a really difficult topic for a lot of reasons that have to do with like defining and identifying people as Jewish. Um, so probably the main takeaway from this is, from kind of what I'm saying here, is that more so than numbers, I think we can be really comfortable saying something along the lines of um, owning other people was fairly common within the Jewish community of Charleston. And we even know that the building there was likely built um, using enslaved labor. They just put a plaque outside of the congregation um, that came from the research of a professor at the College of Charleston. Thank you. Yeah, that, that, your, your, your sentence there at the end actually was a, another one of the questions somebody asked about whether the congregation acknowledges uh, the role of enslaved people. So uh, sounds like that's a recent um, addition. Um, there's a couple of questions here about what the urban slaves did, um, especially with you know with the if if they were involved in, in the trades of of physicians and pharmacists, um, or just what they did for the businesses in, in the cities. Yeah. Okay. This is a great question. Um, Almost everything is um, it, it is kind of the answer. Um, a lot of the skilled labor in Charleston came from enslaved people, um, including carpentry and, and a lot of these trades. The question specifically of the medical field is really interesting 
I've gone back and forth um, actually with my advisor about he remembers reading something at some point about um, African-American enslaved or, or free people um, working specifically as nurses and, and kind of medical assistants. I've asked around and done some searches and not been able to find that piece of scholarship. So if anybody is watching this and um, knows about that and wants to send it to me, my email is on the Brandeis website. Um, but it definitely is the case that enslaved people are doing almost every single kind of labor that you can think about within the city. They are doing manual labor, they're doing skilled labor, um, the, the, right? J just almost everything. They're ubiquitous within the city. Um, this is, uh, historians often talk about um, societies with slaves versus slave societies. And a slave society is a society whose kind of economy is really dependent on enslaved labor. Charleston is a slave society. It, it's slavery, when, when I say at the beginning that s slavery was um, ubiquitous, accepted, and legally sanctioned, um, the word ubiquitous there really is intended to do some work, right? So um, hopefully that answers the question. Yes, yes, thank you. Um, there's a number, number of different questions worded in different ways, but um, essentially the question is, did, did Jews own slaves at the same proportion as the as the, the, the white population or the Christian population um, more broadly? Yeah, so uh, um, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a strange thing. Generally, it's probably about the same with all the caveats about numbers. Dale Rosengarten, who we, um, I'm really fortunate that she came, um, she's one of the, um, the uh, she's one of, if not the leading scholar of um, South Carolina Jewry. She and her husband, Ted, in their book, um, say that Jews own slaves at the same instance, at the same percentage um, as other um, white people in Charleston. I've seen it claimed elsewhere that Jews, um, because they were urban, that Jews as a percentage of the white population may have more frequently been enslavers, but of fewer people, if that makes sense. Um, but certainly it's something where you have to take into account the um, kind of community by community variation. Um, but that's that, I think that's kind of the main, perhaps more frequently than um, kind of other white populations, but Jews are more rarely um, operating these large scale plantations. Not that they never are planters, but they're more rarely planters. Thank you. Um, there's a the question came up that we we, we mentioned briefly at, at the beginning um, before we started um, asking about Jews um, reconciling or opposing slavery, um, especially around the Exodus or, or the Passover story. Um, if you wanted to speak to that, yeah, sure. Let me. Um, I actually put this onto a slide. So let me let me throw this up here. Can you see that? Yeah, great. So I, what I took on this slide here is I just took two quotes really quickly um, from this kind of famous exchange in 1861 on the um, kind of on the eve of the Civil War. And we, we can see if, if we're actually going to start on the right side here, which is a response. What happened was there was a, a rabbi, Morris Raffle, in New York, issues um, gives this sermon on slavery. Michael Halprin, who's this German Jew, um, issues a response. And what we can see is that by the eve of the Civil War, if not earlier, the critique of Jewish enslaving based on the contradiction with Exodus, it was certainly in circulation. So if you look here, we don't need to read this whole quote, but he says, have we not had enough of the reproach of Egypt must the stigma of Egyptian principles be fastened on the people of Israel by Israelitish lips themselves? But there's two things we kind of have to keep in mind. First is that Halprin is generally thought to have belonged to this cohort of Jewish emigres who came to the USA after the failed 1848 revolutions in Europe. 
And so his brand of Jewish abolitionism doesn't really grow until the 1850s. And so that the talk, Delamata dies in 1845. The other thing, um, which I think is important, is that if you look on this left side here, there's a parallel tradition that's not just limited to Jews that saw slavery as, biblical, as consistent with biblical teaching. Um, so again, we don't need to read the whole thing here, but Raphael says, with a due sense of my responsibility, I must state to you the truth and nothing but the truth, however unpalatable and unpopular that truth may be. And of course, he's talking about the truth about um, the biblical sanction of slavery. And so as Laura Liebman kind of points out, points out in her book on Messianism, Secrecy and Mysticism, Sephardic rabbis in the 17th and 18th centuries issued instructions on how to incorporate enslaved people into the Jewish household. And even a biblical literate people like the 17th century Puritans turned to the Old Testament, uh, Testament to justify slavery. And so the question of the Exodus is not necessarily a historical, um, but the sense of this question, like highlighting some sort of inscrutable contradiction, it might say more about our contemporary point of view and relationship with Jewish tradition than it does with the past, if that makes sense. Yes, thank you. Um, it looks like well, you mentioned Laura Liebman. It looks like she's on on this talk also. Oh, really? That's great. Um, in response to your query, do you mean nurses in Charleston or in general? She wrote that I have written about it in Philadelphia. Um, it is a short article about yellow fever in JSS. So, If you wrote it, Professor Liebman, I'm sure it's relevant and great. Um, uh, another, another participant has um, written that her family is from Charleston, and she's asking, is there anything distinctly Jewish about the relationships and collaborations? Um, she notes, it mainly sounds like they work together and spread their mutual interest in slavery through their kinship and community relations, not religious per se. Yeah, this is a great question. So I use the language of Jewishness here um, rather than Judaism for exactly this reason. It's relationships that are based on this kind of shared sense of Jewish identity, of shared, um, a, a commonality of being Jewish. And that that is social capital. Those relationships are formed within a Jewish milieu. Whether or not they are, there's a specifically religious um, kind of category of it, or element of it is something that um, I know other people in the field are kind of working on now, and hopefully that that we'll see more of. And that's been written about in um, in places within other other places within the Caribbean kind of Atlantic world. Um, but I specifically am kind of interested in this idea of Jewishness. Um, coming back to this quote from Corn, I mean I'm interpreting rather broadly of being Jewish. Right. And so really looking at this almost sociological sense of Jewishness um, rather than a strictly religious one. Thank you. And um, a follow up to that, did, did these kinds of relationships of, of kinship and institutional exist in other areas of business, commerce and not just slavery? Definitely. Yeah, and, and, and this is something I, I tried to get at um, at the beginning, right? Um, especially scholars of like the, the Sephardic Atlantic, um, which I've been reading, they look specifically at how um, diaspora creates kind of these kinship, the this, this shared sense of kinship, but also Jewishness, and at times even specifically Portuguese Jewishness that undergirds. Um, relationships across space. Um, Professor Liebman, since she's here, I'll cite her, she has this great chapter on kosher food that kind of gets into um, that, that, that sense of um, how Jewishness created um, trade relations within um, kind of within the Jewish Atlantic world. Remember that many of these 
slave plantations, so many of these slave regimes, these islands in the Caribbean, um, are actually importing a lot of their food from um, what we now think of as the northeastern quadrant, you know, portion of the United States from places um, like New, like Massachusetts, like New York. And that means that if you're Jewish and you want access to kosher food, um, you're buying, oftentimes you might be buying kosher food in Jamaica. You might be buying that kosher meat from somebody who's in, from Aaron Lopez up in Newport. Um, but go go read um, Lord Liebman's chapter. It's really great. Great, great thank you. Um, there's there's a number of questions about whether or not there were different, whether or not Ashkenazi and Sephardi pop, populations, and if there were differences between them or more traditional Jews versus what um, would become more, more liberal Judaism. Okay, let me take this in two steps. Okay. Um, so partially, the Ashkenazi Sephardic um, question is something that I think will come into better focus in the coming years. There's not a lot of research on Jews and slavery. Um, my colleague at NYU, Andrew Gerstenberger, is working in a lot of German language sources that deal with kind of these Ashkenazi groups who come across. As early as 1820, um, the majority of Jews in America are of Ashkenazi descent, but the rights in the passages, right? It's always Beth Elohim follows Minhag Sephardim in, in, at, at this point in time. Um, so the one thing that's come up in my conversations with Andrew and um, that I think my research and his research kind of um, together will show over time Sephardic Jews might be in the Americas longer and have more, or people who are of Ashkenazi descent, but kind of integrate into this Sephardic milieu, I'm including them. But those people ha might have better chances at generating this kind of intergenerational legacy of slavery. Um, if your family starts in Newport in the mid 18th century, like the Lopez, family's, uh, Lopez family, and then after the fall of Newport, um, migrates to Charleston, where um, eventually Aaron Lopez's great nephew um, is the superintendent of like a Confederate armory during the Civil War. That kind of family with this long history of being merchants and successful and members of the Jewish community within the kind of East Coast of what we now think of the United States, those kind of families, which are going to tend to be Sephardic, um, I, I would hazard a guess are going to have an easier time creating these intergenerational ties than, say, um, German immigrants who arrive for the first time in the United States, you know, in 1850. Um, in terms of the liberal and um, more traditional aspect of it, I'm interested in this question, at least in the case of Delamata. I see Lazarus um, and Delamata are really, they are on opposite sides of um, this religious acrimony. De La Mata is a more traditionalist um, Jew. Um, his brother-in-law, Benjamin Lazarus, the executor of the will, is more open to reform. And I see them both kind of interacting with slavery. Um, this is a slave society, right? And, and, and so um, if you're going to be a successful Jewish businessman or a successful businessman to begin with, um, you are probably in some way interacting with slavery. And, and this is something that in, in the future, I do want to kind of tease out more. How exactly are these businesses interacting with slavery? Um, if I can answer for 18th century Newport, there's these really great little slips that you see even people who aren't Jewish send um, in a slave person to Aaron Lopez's, um, to Aaron Lopez's store to buy stuff like nails. Right. And so it'll say, please, please allow my um, my servant so and so to purchase, um, you know, and then it'll say what on my account. And so I'm interested in all the different ways Aaron Lopez also enslaved people making chocolate, um, building his boats. And so all of the different ways that people I think we need to do more work understanding all the different ways that Jews specifically were interacting with enslaved people within Jewish context and non-Jewish context before we can even get there. But for now, I do think 
that um, kind of looking at Lazarus and Delamana, I don't see a huge difference between um, more traditionalist and more reformed Jews. So that was a long-winded answer, but I think I, I, I tried to um, answer it pretty capaciously. Yes, th thank you. Um, looking looking specifically, I, I, I don't know if there's specific anecdotes of, of some of these questions, but um, did, did slaves uh, of Jews embrace, did any of them embrace Judaism as part of their identity? Um, and then another question here, and um, somewhat related, is did Jewish slave owners father children with their female slaves? There's any examples of those? Okay. Um, let me take the first one first. Um, in North America, the research is still getting there. But we do know of Jews of color who are presumably became Jewish by being enslaved, um, there's a woman called Rebecca Marks in um, who's buried in Philadelphia, much to um, Rebecca Gratz um, is much to Rebecca Gratz's consternation. Um, Laura Liebman's book, um, her other book on the Branded family shows um, the shows Jews of color who were born um, to Jewish father in Barbados coming across Aviva Ben Ur. There's a lot of work. There's a lot of work throughout the Caribbean. Um, the degree of integration, Laura Lehman's argued this, maybe she should have given this presentation. Uh, she has argued that the degree to which enslaved people were integrated into um, Jewish households varied based on local conditions. Um, and so we see the clearest examples of people being included in, in Judaism, um, mixed race children of Jewish men in Suriname. And we see the, the clearest lines of demarcation in Newport. Um, okay, that was the first question. There was a second question there, Matt, and I do apologize. Oh, um, whether um, there are stories of, of Jewish slave owners fathering children to um, with female slaves. Yeah, and there's this really interesting family. The son that um, a lot of people know, the Toro Synagogue in, in Rhode Island. Um, Judah Toro had no legitimate children, quote unquote legitimate children. He married or he fathered a mixed race um, child who then married the mixed race child of a Jewish man um, from Virginia. Um, and that's not the only instances we see, um, you know, it, it's hard to tell all the time, but y y you see um, distinctively Jewish names and, you know, the mixed race children of distinctively Jewish people. Um, again, this is a situation, there's a lot more, we know a lot more about the Caribbean, about the Atlantic world than we necessarily know about um, kind of British North America, the, period, the, the region we think of as the U.S., um, but yeah, definitely, I, I wrote um, my first year in graduate school, I wrote a paper in a slightly different context, but about the mixed race um, children of Jewish men in late 19th century, um, Alexandria, Louisiana, which is in central Louisiana. Um, and interestingly enough, there in the late 19th century, I didn't find that any of these children um, maintained a relationship with the Jewish community. Thank you. There's still a number of questions and we're, we're about out of time. Dale says, oh, let me let me share this because Dale, Dale is right. I, I should have thought of this. She says there are numerous instances of mixed race Jewish black offspring in South Carolina and some of the famous ones such as the Cardozos. And there is a new biography even of, of one of the Cardozos. Thank you, Dale. Yeah, yeah thank you. Um, with with only a couple minutes left, I just want to give you a chance if there's any any final thoughts or conclusions that you want, you want to leave us with. Um, um, no, I, I want to thank everyone for coming. Um, it's humbling to see this many people kind of listen to me rant on for um, an hour and a half. Um, I do want to say one thing is that in all of these conversations that we've been having and that we'll, people will continue to have about back Jewish relations, oftentimes we're really focusing on the 20th century, on the different versions of the civil rights movement. If you get one thing from this talk, 
I really do encourage you to think about that 19th century history within those conversations that you're having, this history of slavery, the 18th century even. Um, and really, so, so really considering American Jewish history, not as something that started in 1880, um, but really that has a much deeper, um, a much deeper history, a much deeper set of roots here um, in the United States. A and as present day Jews, we are then the inheritors of that tradition, right? And, and we have to deal with it um, from a Jewish communal point of view with all of the um, good stuff it has and, and all of the warts as well.